tip project plan for each one of those areas. Um, be happy to answer questions. Uh, I, again, I don't know if either one of these gentlemen want to make any comments or from the developer standpoint. Okay. So do you need a motion to open a public hearing on? No, uh -uh. we're setting a public hearing. We're setting, we're setting public hearings. Then on the 27th, <laughs> these will be set for August 27th, which statutorily, there has to be a 30-day window, and that would be the meeting that meets that requirement. At that time, you will open, as you know, we have another item after that, but for the TIP, you'll open three separate public hearings, and then assuming we pass the next item, you'll open three separate CID public hearings, and each one of those will be a separate public hearing related to the district that it's that it is involved in. So tonight we just need motions for resolutions 2018-13-14-15 uh, respectfully setting public hearings for areas one, two, and three. And they're all separate motions. Yes, they are. <clears throat> Make a motion to adopt resolution 2018-13 for the public hearing project area one. Second. This has been moved and second to adopt resolution 2018-13 open is calling for a public hearing related to project one in Village South. Would the clerk please call roll? Okay, um, yes. A lot? Yes. Driver? Yes. Stikes. Yes. I just, do you want the mayor to vote on this or no? I don't think Not so. necessarily. Okay. Just make, make sure. Make a motion to adopt resolution 2018-14, uh, public setting the public hearing for project area number two. Second. Has it been moved and second to adopt res to resolution 2018-14, calling for public hearing related to project no area number two? Would the clerk please call roll? Okay, Yes. Hello? Yes. Driver? Yes. Thanks. Yes. I make a motion to adopt resolution 2018-15, calling for public hearing for project area number three. Second. It has been moved and second to adopt resolution 2018-15, calling for public hearing related to project area number three. Would the clerk please call roll? Okay, Hart. Yes. A lot. Yes. Driver. Yes. Spikes. Yes. All right, the next item on the agenda is consider resolutions called for a public hearing on the advisability of creating the following community improvement districts related to Billy South at Edwardsville project. Uh, much like what we just went through on the tip, the CID, which is a community improvement district where the developer can ask to impose a separate sales tax for uh, various parts of the development one was created back in 2016. Uh, subsequently to that, as you now know, we have uh, these separate areas. And so the CIDs will correspond to those TIP districts, uh, to the overall TIP district, and then plan areas one, two, and three. So we'll be creating CIDs for areas one, two, and three. Again, it requires public hearings for each one of those separately. And tonight we would need the Council to consider resolutions 2018-16-13-18 uh, to set those public hearings for August 27, 2018. I got a question. Yes. So they're asking. It's going to be. I'm just want to make sure I'm reading it right. I know that a CID right. can go up to two percent. Correct. And they're all. They're only asking for one. Yes. So right. That's on, right. On. On. Yes. Good. And we do have. Uh, we actually have to petition. They make they actually petition us for that, and those petitions were submitted accordingly. And we have the original petitions that ask for the creation of the districts in one percent. And that one percent would be for one, two, and three. We're not asking for that can that won't be changed later on, right? Uh, I don't believe I, 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 that's probably a technical question. I'll leave it to these guys, so but it would take if they wanted to change. Good evening, Mayor Council. Yes, that's correct. These okay. will be 1% for the duration, which would be 22 years. For areas 1, 2, and 3, correct? Yes, each, each TIP area has a corresponding CID, so that 1% is collected just in that area. They don't overlap or okay. anything like that. At a later time, area 4 
you know, comes up, they'll have to do the same similar thing for the CID for that area. Correct. Thank you, John. Yeah. And, and I would say, in theory, they can ask for a different amount. Right. Right. I didn't think they were going to ask for it at all. <laughs> well, they have. <laughs> I'm not on for it. I'll make, oh, you know, you're going to say you have to state the date in these motions? Uh, I think it's in the resolution. It's in the resolution. Here we go. You're doing great. Oh, well. <laughs> Uh, make a motion to adopt resolution 2018-16, uh, setting a public hearing for the Edwardsville CID area number one. Second. It has been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 2018-16, calling for a public hearing related to Edwardsville CID district number one. To the clerk, please call. Okay, Mark. Yes. Malott. Yes. Shriver. Yes. Scott. Yes. Make a motion to adopt resolution 2018-17, calling public hearing for uh, CID area number two. Second. It has been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 2018-17, calling for public hearing related to Edwardsville CID district two. Could the clerk please call order? Okay, Arm. Yes. Law. Yes. Driver. Yes. Back. Yes. Make a resolution to adopt. 2018-18, calling for public hearing for CID area number three. Second. Is it been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 2018-18, calling for public hearing related to Edwardsville CID district number three. Would the clerk please call vote? Okay, Yes. Law? Yes. Driver? Yes. Back. Yes. Great. Uh, thanks. <laughs> you. Okay, next item we consider ordinance number 999, adopting this 2018 standard traffic ordinance for Kansas City. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'll cover the first item, which is uh, ordinance 999 regarding the standard traffic ordinance. As you know, each year we adopt the uh, standard traffic ordinance and the uh, Unified Public Offense Code. We typically have some amendments to those. Uh, on the standard traffic ordinance number 9, which is ordinance 999 is what we'll adopt it into our code of ordinances. We are not recommending any changes that haven't previously been part of the standard traffic ordinance. So there's no change as to what we're currently doing. Is it okay to ask a question? Uh, yeah. Yes. I, would, I would prefer that you do a motion and a second and ask the question. So discuss after the motion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, you're quite welcome then. <laughs> but that's a normal procedure. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we're just considering ordinance number 999 and then I'll address a separate action ordinance uh, 1000. But again, the standard traffic ordinance. So the language that you see with the amendments about maximum speeds, uh, about uh, the traffic citation attached to a vehicle, and the use of coasters is the same language that we have today as part of the code of ordinances. Uh, and then the other updates in the STO are the ones that are either statutory or been recommended by the league as a as a broad overall update. Typically, it's statutory. I'd like to make a motion to pass ordinance number 999, adopting the 2018 standard traffic ordinance for Kansas cities. It has been moved and seconded to adopt ordinance number 999, adopting 2018 sta standard traffic ordinance for Kansas City. With the, now, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, a few people, and I don't know if this is the appropriate uh, time to ask about it, but since it's traffic ordinances, a few people have 
asked me about speed limit, specifically on Kansas Avenue okay. from about 100 second after the turn until you get over the highway. Okay. Um, since it's really wide there, it's 30 miles an hour right now. Right. And um, I didn't know if it would be a good time to just discuss the possibility of maybe bumping that to a 35 um, or what that would entail. I mean, you want to make sure it's safe and things like that first, but just since multiple people had asked me about it, I thought it would be a good time to Well, I can. So, generally on a traffic adjustment, you, you mm -hmm. typically get your traffic engineer to decide whether it's speed limit. Actually, that road was designed as a 35 mile an hour speed limit, but PDOT as part of the construction, so we're, we're not bound by this anymore. What we wanted to do was at the corners put basically warning type signs so that doesn't set the speed limit, but you would have warning, you know, slow curve of 30 miles an hour. KDOT said, well, that's not permissible unless you change the grades of the land and things like that. But it, it actually technically is designed for 35 miles an hour, so everything about clear zones and everything else actually should be 35. We kept the speed limit at 30 because that's what it was previously. And so we had heard some feedback that people didn't want to see the speed limit change. So uh, we can do it at any time. Uh, I mean, we could do it as an amendment to this tonight. Because uh, we do have the engineering to design it for 35. Or we could wait until another time if that's there needs to be more discussion about that item specifically. Uh, be the, Call the council. We can do it at any time. This doesn't preempt us from changing any speed of that at any place. Further questions? Would the clerk please call roll? Okay, Arthur. You know, well, I got a question. I think because I think she's probably looking for more direct. Does this need what she's asking? Does it need to be attached to this? Or, no. So we saying? could. Uh, I, I don't know, but, but, so we have. So we. So if you look at the ordinance, and I'm going to go to the second page of the ordinance where it sets the speed limit where it talks about 35 miles an hour. Because I, I, I believe all public streets are set at 25 miles an hour unless otherwise posted. And then your highways. I think inside city limits are 55 unless otherwise posted. So that's the reason you have to post the speed limits. So the only road we have a posting of 35 is Edwardsville Drive. If we wish to add Kansas Avenue, uh, we could amend it in this ordinance. You can adopt this ordinance as amended. You have a current motion, so you would need to either go through the process to amend the motion but we could do that if you want to add that street under the 35 mile an hour to say Kansas Avenue from, uh, I would say from 435, uh, you know, whether we want to do it to 102nd Street or do it around the corner to Brixton, uh, uh, that would be the, uh, the MPL. Once it narrows down, then it would say the 30 miles an hour. So, so you may want to reduce it, you know, at that curve or somewhere there past the curve. So it would be as easy as even moving that 30 mile an hour sign back in front of the curve. And, well, I guess we'd have to repost that sign anyway. Yeah, we, we, I, mean, we have to yeah. I mean, there's some design standards where speed limit sign should be as it relates to intersections, as it relates to a curve and things. So, so signage would just be put where it needs to be. In this case, just deciding where 35 miles an hour should start and end. Well, I drove it um, on the way here just to make sure I, I knew the areas and, and exactly. And I feel like after you make that turn, it's a pretty straight, it's wide open, it's a straight right. shot. Right. Um, I'd be comfortable with it if we're discussing it after you turn and maybe starting at 102nd Street right. and then just going across the bridge to, to where the city line ends. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like, I mean, I have so many 
so many people have talked to me and they've said, we, you know, we're getting pulled over here and we're doing, I mean, it's real easy coming off the highway and just drop into a third it person. Has, I mean, I don't think there's any that kind of support. I mean, again, it was designed for 35. That's what is its design speed. Uh, if we had 35 in the, in the corner itself, we would put advisory signs up to slow the speed to probably 30 as an advisory speed. Again, advisory speeds are not enforceable in the sense you, you know, ways of ticket, but you don't, it's not a speeding ticket. So if somebody wouldn't get a speeding ticket, they could probably be cited under ad hoc conditions. But, but it, it, if you don't want to add a 35 mile an hour zone from uh, the city limit lines west to, you know, 102nd Street, then we can certainly incorporate that in if the, you know, make motions in second order. Well, when the police department is thought to be on that increase in the speed limit, the question I've got is, is it going to impact the stop sign on 98th Street, you know, where people are still kind of getting used to having a stop sign there when they're didn't used to be? Or when there was a stop sign, both, you know, four-way stop. It's a four-way stop. Four stop. Two-way yeah. stop. Yeah, four-way stop. Two but I think, uh, Mr. Webb alluded to the engineering, I think the side triangles, there's enough sight distance from all four angles. Uh, what we get now is it's because of the four-way, I mean, you don't want to use them as speed deterrents, but that did slow things down. Now we have this kind of, like you said, the open road and things like that. But we fielded some calls. And I, I, I don't know exactly the persons that were complaining about the speeding as a problem. They wanted us to make a priority to do some uh, you know, directed enforcement on that already. And it, more than likely, my impression was coming from the homeowners there who now have seen this kind of an open road. But I think the engineering really says what it should be. It should be 35. I think we have to discuss whether that curve is, is going to be added, uh, you know, some danger in some way. I think if you hit the 35 to the 100 second, you will at least uh, have some slowdown. If you take it all the way up to Rich, uh, Richland, you're going to come around the curve and go north. So when we're talking about speed enforcement, you're looking at 9 to 12 miles an hour over on the average. So we're going to be pushing that speed up there. I don't. I really don't think personally that that's a problem. But I, th I know the clerk has fielded the call or two and sent an email out about the speeds along that particular road. And that's really. But for us, set the speed limit and we'll we'll go do our job. Mike, can I say something? Because sure. I've had fielded numerous phone calls about the vehicle speeding along that stretch and the property owners like the lower speed. I'm not saying it should stay that way, but I, I'm just throwing that out. I, I feel probably six or seven phone calls from various property owners since the year and a half that I've been here about um, the speed along that route, saying that you know, they'd like for it to actually be reduced. So I just thought I'd put that out. Just give you some. Gosh, I didn't see that being reduced. I would say we probably we probably get calls on both sides of that, and and I don't think it's I think it's fairly typical if it's the street in front of your house, you, you typically want to see the speed lower. If I take that road and I'm looking at it, it's you know you've got uh, 28 feet of pavement out there, uh, and uh, I live somewhere else, and that's my path home. Is a van. Why is it so slow? So I, I think probably calls probably some, you know are both. But again, that's one of the reasons why I don't know that it's an absolute. Uh, the, the, the attorney can answer, but that's why you typically look to having an engineering study done before you alter speed limits up or down. But I do know that the road is specifically designed for 35, and there was discussion about changing the signs out, but. And it doesn't show on here that it was 35, and it doesn't show on here that it was 30. Uh, but basically, the 30, and maybe that's the standard, it says on any urban non-business district not otherwise designated. So that road you know, would have been classified that way, uh, and which is why it was set for 30 back in the day. So I mean, 30 is probably more a lot of people were here. But it, yeah, prior to it the improvement, 30 was, was right. fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I, for, prior to the improvement, it was 30 was fast. And, now, so, yeah. and, and yeah. it, it very hilly, right? And, and hard, you didn't have clearance and visibility. You didn't have 
you ran off the road, there wasn't any safe zones or anything like that. And it, it was designed as a 35 mile an hour design speed for the road uh, when it was designed. So. My, my thoughts on it is we don't take it around the curve. Right. Yeah. We stop at 102nd Street. It's, it, the, the road was designed for it. It's really a better road than 110th Street or Edwards Moore Drive, which is at that same speed limit. Right. So, well, I I we amend the motion. I'll amend the motion. I'd like to amend the motion to include Kansas Avenue from 102nd Street to the east city limits to 35 miles an hour. Second. Okay, what we're going to do now is we have to we have to deal with the amendment first, and then we'll deal with the motion. So the motion uh, is to amend the the speed limit on Kansas Avenue uh, to increase it to 35 from say city limits to go west to 102nd Street. Is that clear? Yes. Yes. Okay. Would the clerk please call the roll? K R. Yes. Moa. Yes. Shriver. Yes. Stuck. Yes. Now we'll uh, we'll go ahead and do the motion as amended. Like if there are no other questions, well, we've already got a motion a second, so mm -hmm. we don't need it again. Okay. And that is for the adoption. Yeah, of for the adoption of nine 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 as amended. As amended, that's correct. Okay, the clerk be called. K R. Yes. Pollock. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Stuckers. Yes. Thank you. Um, next will be considered ordinance number 1000 adopting 2018 uniform <laughs> public offense offense code for Kansas City. Well, there was several uh, again changes, mainly uh, most of the changes on this side had to do with uh, things such as battery against law enforcement officers, and drug paraphernalia, and some things like that. that was, that weren't previously in here or have been amended by statutes. Uh, so I will go through, uh, I'm not sure, well, I'll just let me go through it and then we can come back to it. So the first amendment on the unlawful discharge of firearms, I know this has come up several times. I'm sure we'll have some discussions here. But the current statute, so the current UPOC, basically says you can't discharge a firearm in the city limits recklessly. And a number of years ago, the legislature passed any number of amendments related to basically around the, the, the carry, right to carry laws. And most of those were around, you know, if somebody comes onto your property or if you're being attacked by an animal that weren't really codified. And so those got, those got added in there. The one that has been question has been, as it reads today on the unlawful discharge of a firearm, there are uh, six exceptions, seven exceptions. And the one being B3 that we're talking about is it is not illegal to discharge a firearm if you are lawfully taking wildlife in the city and you're in compliance with the Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism and or the government body. So the government body could not allow it or they could allow it under some circumstances. The feedback basically we've gotten over time has been, well, we're not real keen about eliminating it, and but we're not very happy that somebody in theory could be setting in Williamson's farms and have a license and pull out a 30 out six and shoot a deer. I mean as it reads, that would not be against the law unless they did so recklessly. So what we propose, based on feedback, what we typically hear is, well, I, I have a large piece of land. I, I might want to hunt with a shotgun. I don't, you know, the long rifles is where the concern is because the projectiles go so far. So what we proposed in here is basically that item would limit only hunting by shotguns. The other option was not to allow hunting in the city at all. I know there's mixed feelings on that item, but that's what that one is. Uh, let me go on to the others just so that we can, you know, the one related to the air rifle, air gun, bow, air slingshot, BB gun, or paint gun, 
is the one we've had for a long time. Again, as the statute reads, it's kind of interesting, but it would be unlawful to discharge any of those types of weapons in the city unless you amended it to allow it. So it's almost the opposite. The statute says it's okay to discharge a firearm under these circumstances, but you couldn't go out and come up with a bow and arrow unless we make it. <coughs> Considered different on this firearm definition as it's in there. So there's no changes to that section. Uh, the issue with barbed wire, again, is not a change. We've always allowed barbed wire in our ag zones. Again, the UPOC says you can't have barbed wire inside the city limits. For me, obviously, we have a lot of agricultural areas. They use barbed wire. So we put this amendment in. I don't know how, at least 10 years ago. And then the two repeals of the 06.004.006 have to do with, with basically possession of paraphernalia, marijuana, THCs, and some of these other products, which was not covered in the, in the UPOC previously. And so we had our own separate ordinances related to that. But as that has changed over the number of years, they finally basically decided through the League of Camp Municipalities that we're going to have a uniform rule as it relates to that and try to be up to date. And so we were just, so we just had conflicting language. So we don't need our local ordinance anymore if we adopt the UPOC that has basically the same language as we had with some updates that are positive updates. And I hope the Chief and the City Attorney can address those if we need to. So, uh, Again, the only thing, well, probably the biggest change is this issue about the unlawful discharge of a firearm. But again, we, we basically are saying if it's with a shotgun, it's permissible, and it have to be in the shoot zone, which we haven't proposed any changes to the shoot, don't shoot zone. Uh, we provided a little cleaner map there. We may clean that up some more. But basically, as you can see, the area south of K-32, more or less, and the area that goes up in and around what, which would be most of your residential areas, Williamson's Farm, uh, oh, Edge Hill, the, those areas where you have more density of housing. And then everything else at this point is would be allowed to be within the sheet zone. That is the proposal and we're happy to answer questions. I'm not in favor of eliminating hunting at all. I, I've done it and will continue to do it um, in Edwardsville. But I have a question about, so this air guns and air rifles, so even if you are in the shoot zone, you cannot discharge any of these? Is that correct? You can because we allow it. I don't why in the shoot zone. You can discharge those in the shoot zone. If we didn't have this amendment, you would not be able to discharge them in the city unless you were inside the building. So we made it more liberal, I guess, in that particular means to say you could go out and use a bow and arrow. Otherwise, if we adopted the uh, UPOC as is, you would not be able to use any of those outside of a uh, confined building or other structure. And I'm uh, guessing that a uh, crossbow falls under bow and arrow? I believe that's correct. Do, do you because that's gotten that? really popular. Right. It's it's a house of mine. Yeah, it, yeah it, just, it just says bow and arrow slingshot. Yeah, yeah, it's not a firearm. Sort of yeah, it's not a firearm. Well, as far as the high power rifle, yeah, uh, and that was really the issue. I, I mean, I know you and I have had this to deal with. How do you how do you find that safe? Because it says I could. Yeah, currently it does. There's nothing that says you can't hunt anywhere in the city. So yes, you could go into any place in the city and hunt with any form of a fire, any firearm in the city. So right now you can hunt with a firearm in Williamson Park? Because yes. I thought you couldn't shoot outside the shoot zone. 
Chief no. John has nothing to do with this, right? unless we adopt it that way. Oh. <laughs> and that's why we should so tell me what no shoot zone means, because I guess I'm not, I'm not clear on The shoot zone, no shoot zone, only relates, <laughs> as it is today, to sections 10.6, which relates to air guns, air rifles, bow and arrow, slingshots, BB guns, or paint shot guns. But we propose to make those uniform that 10.5 B3 would be amended. And basically the two amendments is it would limit it to shotguns and a 12 gauge or, or less uh, I am mentioned, shotguns for the part. And it would limit it to only being in the shoot tops. Yeah, I mean, okay. Well, I mean, I'm not in favor of eliminating the right to shoot a uh, high power rifle on, in areas where it's not uh, safe. I think I've been the question of sure. that area. So we have to amend that, right? Wasn't it a, did it depend upon acreage, the amount of acreage, wasn't there something in there a few years back about? Maybe years ago. Yeah, it was talking about when Craig brought it up. Yeah. yeah. There was something about the amount of acres. Yeah, we talked about that. We were talking about that. I remember we don't know what that, that is. is. I mean, from a law enforcement standpoint, you know, how, when you decide it is or isn't, whose acres, and uh, I, I think that was so. I mean, the discussions we had in the past was trying to find some sensible things that you want to allow me. We can leave it exactly as is. I, I think just this understand. Is, this is a, a step in the right direction, I think. Yes. I'm kind of wondering about the definition of a firearm, though, um, on 10.5b3.3. Well, a firearm is a firearm shotgun. What about there's not anything about rifles, handguns? Is that in a different section of this? So, what we're saying is it would limit it to shotguns. If, if you want it open to the and you can take that out, but yeah. a firearm is defined as any weapon designed or having the capacity to propel a projectile by force of an explosion or combustion. That is the definition of firearms in the unified public offense code. So, I could be wrong, but if you're defending livestock, for example, oh, hypothetically, wouldn't some different firearms be more capable and more safe in actually getting the job done than a shotgun? Yeah, and there's nothing that prohibits the, the, the protection of your livestock. That, that this only has to do with hunting within the city limits. Most cities, quite honestly, don't permit the use of a firearm for hunting within the city limits. I, I don't believe it's a, a, a allowed in uh, the UG and inside KCK. They allow bow arrows in hunting areas, and they have inside Bonner. They have a shoot zone which is a limited area. So inside mm -hmm. the shoot zone, they allow any type of weapon. I think in KCK, they don't allow they don't allow that particular, they rewrote the whole section, but you can't discharge a firearm in the system for much for any reason. Now, certain things have come along that limits that right. So you have a right to protect yourself and others. You have a right to protect livestock and so they, that, that a preempted local, any type of a local so if we don't make any change at all, right? We haven't had an issue before, right? Well, we've had people. We have had some people say, "Why can they hunt here?" You know, they I feed the deer and then somebody shot the deer. I, I mean, it's not been a big issue. You're right. Yeah. Uh, I think we've had one case go to court where they were hunting, where they were shooting. They were technically in. Uh, the question is, were they reckless and were they shooting? What were they actually doing? Wildlife. I mean, I don't know what the outcome of the court. They, uh, they were charged. The off the building. Yeah, they were charged. Uh, I, I don't know what the final outcome was. I mean, right. So it, I, I would say it's a big issue. It was. Just, it's one that seems like every year we have some discussion about hunting within the city limits. Where it should be? How it should be? Knew it was going to come up. So if we're going to do it, it it's kind of like to your question earlier. If you're going to amend it while you're adopting, it's the best time to amend it. We don't have to. We can leave. You can strike out ten point that section altogether, 
and it leaves the UPOC as is. Well, I totally agree that it needs to be in a safe manner. I mean, right. you know, just because you're shooting, I'm going to say, for example, Dove, right. you know, on the Call River, right. and there's a, a carload of people sitting over there, that's shooting in an unsafe manner. Just because you have the right to shoot a shoot right. Dove, you know, you still have to, you know, there's a code of ethics for hunting also, right. you know. Um, and what would happen in that, so, and the chief could probably address this better, but, I mean, the question becomes, are they reckless in what they're doing, right? So what you have, what you have to prove, I mean, if you discharge a weapon in a reckless manner, it's against the law. If you're hunting, if you're doing whatever, if you discharge it in a reckless manner, then, then I don't, then the law talks about, I mean, if it's a reckless manner, then you're violating the discharge. Well, I think that leaves it up to too much interpretation. That's the problem. Because then, just if, because because you shot a deer on five acres, right? Somebody can come and say, "Well, golly, that, that's reckless." Well, no, because there was a whole. You know, I'm just saying, there's a burn behind there. It's a safe direction. There's no houses behind it. So how's it reckless? Well, I think it is because you're geographically your location. Right. So I don't like that either. Right. Would it make more sense to open up hunting in the shoot zone and not have it in the no-shoot zone? Or, I mean, I just... Well, the, the example that he's given is um, happened in the no-shoot zone, down on the river, okay. shooting duck. So would you eliminate hunting in the no-shoot zone? Or would that mm -hmm. go, no, it could probably take off everything. Right. So again, the, the, the base the base law says it's unlawful. It, so the violation would be it's an unlawful discharge of a firearm is the reckless discharge of a firearm within or into the corporate limits of any city. So within the city limits here, if you discharge a fire if you discharge a firearm in the city limits by section A, that's not the legal. They then added B and these exceptions from you can defend yourself in your person or another person in the property. Uh, you can discharge it at a private, uh, at a private or public shooting range. So, like the scout camp has a has a shooting range for the Boy Scouts. If they're right, that would not be prohibited. Uh, I'll well, neither there. would anybody's house that they say is a range. If it's a public or private range, right. I don't know. I don't know what the definitions of that. Are. Right. I mean, I can set ten cans up and shoot in the berm, and it, it's my range. I didn't write it. I, you know I, what I'm saying? I, yeah. I, 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 don't, I, understand. I don't. I don't like for it to be that vague. Is right. all I'm trying to say. But it is. Um, Obviously, law enforcement officers can discharge them in their duty. Parks and wildlife like people, right? Uh, Special permit of the chief of police or the sheriff from the city has no police department, so that would never apply to us. So that's the old posse situation where you the mayor could form a posse with the chief to form a posse. Not back in the old day. Technically, the mayor still has that authority. Do then? <laughs> well, see, I mean, and, but I also agree too that someone in Williamson Farm or the trailer court right. shouldn't be able to. Set up tin cans and shoot at a nice berm they made, and call it their private range. I, I so this was an attempt to find some I know, I reasonable I understand. place because maybe, maybe, I knew you know, know what maybe it does maybe it does make an acreage deal come back because that's what Craig started to do yeah. when he was here. Maybe it's unless you have five acres or more, right. because. Well, however many you know that we come up with that makes sense because you know you're not going to have that in Williamson Farm. You're not going to have it in. Does that change the river? And, and the only challenge, I mean, and again, you know, if the officer comes up and somebody's discharging the firearm, how are they going to? I think part of well, that was the schedule for. So then, what's the method? You know, mechanism of five acres or more, or I mean, how do you get know, the full I mean, tax roll? Right. Sure. I mean, your parcel number. Was, right. they, was there an issue with dove hunting beside the river or something? Yes. Was it private property? Who yes. owns the property? Yes. It, it was private property. I mean, most of that's all private property out to the river, even though the river itself is under basically the control of 
you know, the high watermark or the normal watermark uh, as, it relates, watermark. as it relates to activities, but, but it's private property. I mean, there, if you look at the D, most of those all go to the center line of the river or somewhere out in the river. It's actually the corner point. So. Would that be an amendment then to maybe change this no shoot zone to so far from the river or the private properties along the river bank or something? Could you do something like that to solve this? Is it, I mean, I, I like the new no shoot zone other than. Maybe we just don't change it at all. But what we're talking about, you know. Mm -hmm. than, I mean, I would say personally, I would leave it as is versus mm -hmm. trying to make all the whole bunch of extra thing too. Personally. <laughs> And then, again, the police department, if they believe the person is acting in a reckless manner, right, then they can charge them with that and then get the court to make the decision whether the action was reckless or not and whether they should be you know, proceed. So the down and dirty processes don't even make a motion? No, I think we make a motion striking out okay. the amendments to section 10.5.3. I think everything, everything else, as I, everything I else is as is, or well, we're, you said we're just eliminating, didn't figure what you were talking we're just about. eliminating conflicts. Okay. Right? That's the only one that is really new in this system. So, if so you, the, the down and dirty is just to adopt it with the, with by the striking the section 10.5.3 from okay. this ordinance leaving it as is okay. in and yeah, like, okay. yeah, and it doesn't change anything. That you still have to have what the state and the federal requires you. Yeah, you have to have like, license. I'm just going to, for right. example, when I go do something right. in Edwardsville, right. I've had my state stamp, my federal stamp, I have to my hip stamp, right. and three rounds in the gun to because that's what the right. state law says. Absolutely. And you still have to abide by that. Yes. You know, nothing changes there. Yeah, you can't just, I mean, it doesn't mean you can go run water, waterfowl with a multi-capacity weapon because it's not permitted under law as it is. Multi-capacity. Yeah. <laughs> I don't that. I don't want to use high-capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's work. So go this ahead. is a point of clarification about the acres which was discussed. That is in the bow hunting section that it has to be three acres or more of under 10 Point six B, so it does refer, and that's where the acreage discussion may have come in the past as well. That is what it is. So what it says is the acreage size has to be three acres or more in order to bow hunt on the property. And we can adopt ordinance number one thousand striking out and limit ten point five B three. Second. I'm not going to repeat that motion, but. But anyway, the motion has been made in second to adopt uh, the 1,000 ordinance striking section, whatever it was. Okay. okay. Would the clerk please call roll? Okay, you are? Yes. Moa? Yes. Driver? Yes. Stein. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Mike, it's your turn to... Presentation of good planning for 2019 angel budget. Just reading this real quick. Okay. Uh, well, this is just a continuation of some discussions that we've been having related to the budget. There will not be any action as of tonight. We will at our next meeting set the maximum available budget and we will set the public hearing, which also will occur on the 27th. So I think we'll rename the 27th the public hearing night. Uh, so we'll have lots of public hearings that night. Uh, again, y'all are aware of the six critical success factors that were set by uh, the council and staff a few years ago, we continue to use those as our focus when we are uh, putting together the budget. Uh, I'll start by just giving a little update on the revenues and expenditures. You saw this, uh, I think, at the last meeting. Uh, so what we've tried to do is do some look back and some look forward as what we think revenues will do. 
uh, start trying to think about our budget process being a long-term process versus an annual process. There's certainly an annual piece to it, but as we start thinking about the impacts of decisions, they often go across multiple years. So, uh, again, some of this is, is still a little bit of work in progress because we're still updating numbers for mid-year. But as you can see, basically 16 and 17 are actuals. Uh, you see we grew by about $500,000 between 16 and 17 in revenues. Uh, 18, uh, we're projecting that to go down a little bit. Uh, again, I think some of those are still in, uh, still in review. And then we basically expect that there'll be some increase over uh, the next number of years uh, in various revenue categories. And then basically looking at it with expenditures and we're, we're making some assumptions here right now that basically we, we typically are within 2% of what we budget on the expenditure side. So we basically said we're going to assume we're 2% over on the budget, even though that's not always the case. Uh, but oftentimes we get more revenue in and that's why we have the budget amendments that we do each year. But again, we see uh, some increase. Uh, if we look at, I think I got this right, 2019 right now projected, what we're assuming based on some discussions we're going to have tonight, that we would have a relatively balanced budget at this point. So the last couple of years, we generally assumed some reduction in our cash balances. The last couple of years, we think that for 2019, we should be able to hold, you know, kind of hold it stable and, and level. Obviously, there's a lot of discussions that go around that, but that's our projections that we're using now that will be put into the next budget cycle. So I think at the, the last meeting or the one before that or several before that, I basically said our focus for staff is on these three areas, pay people and capital. We're, not that we don't spend time on all the other things, professional services, contract services, the things we're already paying for, we have to pay for, computers, etc. We really want to focus the attention in these three areas of paid people and capital. So I'm going to go over those uh, and try to make them as, as clear as possible. I'm hoping it maybe gives you some opportunity to ask questions about these areas, uh, some of them priorities. Uh, what your feelings are. The first area that we've talked about is just the pay plan. As you know, we've, we've had a number of discussions about this. Uh, we did a mid-year adjustment of COLA of 2%. We didn't do anything with the pay plan. We just simply adjusted it by 2%. What we're proposing, and it'll make a little more sense in the next slide, is that basically we're going to move all the pay grades up. So whatever B is become A and C becomes B. And so it, it basically, you can say moves up or moves down, but it increases uh, the pay in those. We're also going to set across the board a seven step plan. Some of our jobs are five and some are, are seven. So mainly from the corporal or the master control officer down on the police side, similar on the fire side. Uh, the public, some of the public works positions and the admin are seven and then others are five. We did that a couple of years ago because we had so many people pushing up against the top of the pay grade. And as, as you know, that was one of the discussions we had was, you know, on average, our people are sitting around a step four on a five-step grade. So this gives some additional uh, increases going forward into the future. That being said, if we do these two things, Everybody, for the most part, there's a few people that are on probationary, so they'll have adjustments. But basically, you won't change from your current pay grade and step. So if you're at A4, you'll still be an A4, but you'll get paid more for the step A4 than you're currently being paid. And that basically works out to 5%. So, and the reason that is, and I'll go to the next slide, if you, if you basically look, and this is off our pay plan, uh, that's approved. If I look at step A here, we start at 1464 and we go to 1748. So we have these seven steps across. 
and then the pay grades go from A to Z, and we basically break out the non-exempt and the exempt, that is, if they're non-exempt or exempt as it relates to overtime, but we follow the same scale. So what we're suggesting is, if I'm sitting here at A3 today, I'm paid $15.53 an hour. What we would do is simply move this whole basic row up, and so now that person in step three would be making sixteen thirty-one. Does so this reflect the two percent colon increase that we just made? It does. Okay. Yes. So it, it's already incorporating that. So yes. So we're we're moving them up, and again, most of our problem is not down here. It's mainly in this four to seven area is where we get farther and farther away. This won't totally solve that, but it certainly makes some pretty good moves towards it. So you say that this pay grade goes from A to Z. Right. So, I mean, right. no. why are we only looking at A to D? Then? Oh, I'm just using this for an example. It, so, but, the I same mean, so where are our people? I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I mean are we in people, A to D? Uh, a to E probably mm -hmm. is about half the people. And, and, and probably after who's the G, out of who's out of where you get into like EMT paramedics. I mean, yeah, Z is Z is the city manager, just as the way it put together. Uh, department heads are you know, P's, Q's, R's. Could we? Have, could would you send us that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it's, and so, but what we're suggesting is just moving the whole thing, right? Just moving it all. So A's get paid with B's, B's get, you know, so it just keeps moving. It can say up or down, but you're just, effectively it ends up being a 5% COLA if you want to look at it that way. Well, if you include what was done in the current year. Right, just right during a month ago. But what we know is we're not in the market. I mean, I mean, we know that, right? I, I pretty well across the table. And we know most cities, at least what we're getting, are doing their pays are going to be in the 4% or better range. 4% is about the average increase that we're hearing from, you know, our market area. And again, we don't, even outside of our market. Area. Two and two, pretty common. Two percent yeah. common, two percent. Some are doing that. Some are doing, mm -hmm. you know, that. some are doing all colors. A number of people are doing pay plans. I mean, revising their whole pay plan so they're moving people around. The reason I'm proposing this from a simplicity standpoint and for our people is then you start trying to say, oh, well, I'm going to move, and there'll be some of that that has to happen, a few positions, but when you start trying to move whole categories of people here and here and here, you get into that, well, you know, why did you move him to, you know, why did he go two grades and I only went up one grade, or why did you do that? This is a system that the employees are used to, they, they like, at least that's the feedback we get as far as we like knowing where we're at and we like knowing where we're going to progress to. And we, and, and we know if I'm a patrol officer and I move to master patrol officer, I'm going to go one or two grades up and then I got that opportunity and I become a sergeant. And I, so it's something that's clear. It's easy to put in the system, you know, get the employees know what they're getting and, and where they're going. And so that's the reason we put it in eight years ago. Uh, basically, what we didn't do is we didn't really keep up with the pay plan through colors. Just that, that's really where we fell behind. And fundamentally, it's just a matter of money. I mean, I mean, you can only. I mean, the council is always very generous. We always move people on the steps, but the steps were getting behind the market. So, where maybe step three or four was the market before, now it's seven. So that's the the concept there on the pay plan. Yeah. So so if if A through D right e seems to be where we're lacking the most, why would we lack a five percent across the board? Well, I would say you're lacking when you're higher levels. Your gaps are higher as you go up the scale. Your department head levels, your captains, your fire captains, your police captains. And, and so you'll, so what I want to, what, if yeah. you'll send us, what I want to see is where, who's at A, who's at B, okay. who's at C. Yeah, we've got where, every, where that's at. Oh, every position, I don't, yeah. Okay, okay. No, I mean, I, yeah. I don't know if a, I'm just trying A's to be an on catcher or yeah. B's the 
fire chief? You right. don't know them. Right. And I will tell you, some of those positions, we have some that are too low on the, on the grades, in my opinion. We're not with the quality issues. And that's where you have to move people within grades. But, you know, you always have, I mean, pay plans, I don't care where you're at, there's always that comparison. Well, I do the same thing as that person does, so I should really be on that pay grade, or I should be on that. We really look at this from the market. So if I go out and look at a firefighter paramedic, what is a firefighter paramedic making in the grade? Or if a police officer, what, what do they make? Now, we also know we're not going to be paying probably, you know, KCK or Overland Park type wages, but we still compete with them, and we have to consider that. I mean, we can't totally discount it. And sometimes people say, that's okay, I don't want to go to that place because I don't want to be in a bigger city, or, you know, I feel like I got more opportunities in one place than another. I mean, that's an individual personal choice, but we can't not be cognizant of what the market is. And for us, again, the market is predominantly on the Kansas side of the metro area, but we also get, you know, the other side of the metro area. We get people that come from, you know, down south near Wichita or Salina or Hayes or, you know, I think the chief showed me something the other day. I mean, they're hiring paramedics in Junction City for significantly higher starting wages than we pay you. Would it be all right if you're, if we're breaking it down that way? Right to also just define how you get, is it longevity, or you talked about promotions, but how do you get from step three to four, or five to six, yeah. um, just so we can It's all about, that is longevity. It's all about it. It was, two parts. It, assuming that the funds are there and the council approved in the budget, that, and if, if so, and you obviously are passing, you know, your, your appraisals, you know, that you're doing your job, then you would go up. To move up in the grades, generally it, it's going to be one of two ways. Either one, that that position's in the wrong grade, or more than likely is you're moving up in grades because you're promoting to another position. At some point you get, and we, we have people, right? I mean, they get out here, uh, and you get to this, this end of the level. What we've done typically that the council's approved, we've given some form of a longevity pay a one time so it doesn't impact their annual salaries but we say okay we're going to do for all those people that are capped out we're going to give them a two percent one time pay and that gets processed basically in January and that, that's that's historically what we've done so we're not really trying to change anything historically just trying to upgrade the, the values in there. and again you could call it a, you could just go in there and add five percent and call it a cola if that's what you want to do we don't do a merit-based system. We're a step and grade system, not a merit-based system. Right? And some cities use the merit-based, and so they'll do it. You know, they have really broad ranges, and, and they'll say, this is our bottom, and this is our top, and maybe they have a median, and then they'll say, we're going to do a COLA, and they just adjust all those, and then we'll decide if you're going to get a 1% or a 2% merit increase. Personally, I don't think merit pay works anymore. I mean, I remember. Many years ago, early in my career, you know, you had merit pay going from 2% to 10%. And quite honestly, somebody who really wants to work hard and bust it sees that 10% in its value, but if it's between 2.5% and 3%, it, it pay just doesn't have the same impact. And it's not the only driving force, right? I mean, our people enjoy the benefits that we give to them, or to them health care, and our days off and some of those things that quite honestly they don't get in the private market and they don't necessarily get in other cities. I mean, many places, here's your health care. This is the one you get. You know, it's got a high deductible. That's your only choice. You know, that's just the way it So we've always tried to have a little more choice. On so are you going to, uh, are we going to get like uh, supporting documentation of size, cities of uh, equal size or close to it and where theirs are at? Is that what you're going to? I, I can't, I mean, that's part, if you remember a couple of meetings back, we went through, again, we didn't try to hit every position. I can give you every position. We looked at roughly, I think it was about 30 different communities uh, in and around this area, both above and below 25,000. We broke it out on the Missouri side and the Kansas side. So if you remember that. So why would we look above 25,000? 
and for a city of 4,000. Well, I'm still competing with Lenexa and Shawnee and Elgin Park and Atlanta and Leewood and Roland Park and Lansing and UG. I mean, that's who we compete with. I mean, the, the pay doesn't, the pay's not based on size, and I don't think you can compare Edwardsville, Kansas to a city in far western Kansas is the same size. It, it, it's not the same. Okay. All right. So the second piece of this, and, and the numbers you saw here earlier incorporated the cost of doing that into the numbers that you saw back on the slide that said basically on the cash balance where it showed anticipated revenues and anticipated general fund expenditures. So we can fund that, that change. Uh, the second area that I talked about is people. Uh, I don't think it's any uh, surprise that uh, every department has needs and we're all working a lot of, wearing a lot of hats and doing a lot of things. And we don't have enough money to do all the things we want to do. And we won't be doing this, but I wanted to at least give you an idea of the areas that we're looking at. So basically in the admin area, and I'll talk about it more, you know, looking at a, a finance manager or finance clerk, it's really going from a full-time to a part-time ad position. And that's mainly being driven by our finance manager is considering uh, retirement in next year. And so we're at least trying to plan around it. We were already looking to do a part-time person, but if we can arrange it to where she can go from full-time to part-time, I think that's her preferred, uh, allows her to continue to work and we get the advantage of the knowledge that we wouldn't get by a, you know, a part-time person coming in here. So that's one. Uh, obviously, on the fire side, what's always a challenge on the fire side, you kind of hire, hire in threes. All right? So it, it doesn't help you to put one extra on one shift and not on the other, so you tend to hire in threes. The police department, and, and they've talked about this for years, about what's the, what's the staffing level by the various studies that are done, and you know, the, the preferred is to add that one per shift and do it over maybe a three year period. And then we've talked about seasonal workers, how we can use those more, and also looking at their pay and how we, we're not very consistent in that area. So we have somebody working in parks, it's, you know, mowing and cutting grass, and they were paying them nine dollars. You got somebody working in public works that's mowing and cutting grass, and we're paying them eleven dollars. You know, we need to look, and that's really internal. How do we solidify that and decide what it is we want our seasonal people to be doing? And, and yes, sir. I have a question. If we have somebody that's being paid nine dollars or a ten or eleven right. or twelve or thirteen, all the way up to fourteen sixty three. Yeah. How come they're not on this pay grade? They have not paying. Because we haven't done seasonal part-time people in our pay plan. Seasonal or part-time? Yeah, we're talking about seasonal part-time people. Not okay. full. This, this is full-time only. Only full-time only? Yes. Okay. These Got are full-time people. Okay. But, but what we're saying is we actually do need to have a seasonal part-time pay. So it may not be the same as that. But mm -hmm. say you pay somebody, maybe it's $12 well, this well. year, next year, we decide that the market now is 12 50 or whatever. We won't necessarily have an automatic step up increase, but we have part, you know, some people are seasonal and some time are part time. So in the fire department, we have part time, what I call permanent part time people. So they're a, they're a paramedic or an EMT. They don't necessarily work a set schedule all the time, but, but they're, they're here. And so they, like any other firefighter, has to go through at least a certain probationary period to make sure they are understand our equipments and all the things. And so typically, and it's, again, not been very well designed, it's like, okay, you're a beginning guy. Oh, you've been here a year now. We're going to give you an adjustment. And we, we kind of built that in, but we need to put more specificity to the plan for our part-time and our season. Because I, I mentioned that just because we know that's something we need to do. Uh, I come ask you. Yeah. Part time and seasonal. Right. What right. the benefits today? They do not. No. And you know, some places look at do you give? Do you, you know? Again, I'm going to use the fire department because that's where we really have part time people on a permanent basis, but we can do it in admin. You know, 
do you want to give them some limited benefit? Some places do that as a, you know, you're working, you're getting less per hour, but we're going to give you, you know, some type of medical or we'll give you, you know, four or six days a year to the typical 12. We really haven't gotten into that. that that's maybe a little bit of the discussion. Obviously, they all have financial impacts. Is really the question. Okay. How, how many full-time do we have on the PD and full-time on the fire department? Uh, we have 18 in PD, including the admin person, and we have uh, 17. 17 in the fire. And there's not an admin that's not on the fire side. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. So, <clears throat> I'll just move on. Uh, so again, the discussions have been uh, with Michelle. This is something she brought up. She's sitting here, so she can not read one way or the other. I don't know which way she's doing. But, as her husband has been talking about this idea of being able to retire. Uh, she's done her own research into that, and that's something she's come to us about. You know, maybe sometime uh, second quarter, mid year uh, of doing retirement, but would like to stay on maybe in a reduced role, part time role. There's some rules that Capers has about how you're working after retirement and some things that we've got to see if we can work within that system we may or may not be able to and that may change it uh, but we you know we know that that probably that cost whether it's doing it this way or hiring another person is probably going to it, it run in that range of 25 to 35 thousand we would hire a new uh, person to be the finance manager so we hire a full-time person to fill that spot and then uh, and she would stay on in this part-time capacity around finance things. You know, be able to focus on the payroll only, on the accounts payable, for some of those things. And as you know, the auditors always ding us that they want to see more separation of duties. This is one option to do that. So on the fire side, really our need, and of course all our people are cross-trained, but our need is that the, the firefighter EMT, and it's mainly to support the ambulance service. And as you all know, the vast majority of calls today are medical related calls. They're not fire related calls. But most of your staffing models are around fire relations, not around EMS coverage. So we're looking at different potential models. Again, I'm giving you the impact. I don't know that we'll be able to do this. But we don't think it's we don't think it's feasible at this point to bring three full time people on day one you know, January 1 and do that, because that's about a $250,000, hit. And, and again, some of the reason there's variances here, because people take different insurance packages, and so we have, depending on whether they have families or don't have families, money, that insurance cost can range from $8,000 to $14,000 or $15,000 cost to the city, so it just varies based on, that's probably the biggest variation. And in place and fire, your retirement, it just right, the KPF retirement is about 25% of the annual wage. It just, that's what it is. It doesn't matter if it's police, fire, EMS, that's just, that's what it is. And it's about 10% on the admin side, our cost. Nothing we can, you know, that's just the cost of having people. But obviously, it costs more to hire one police or firefighter than it does to hire one admin. But what we've looked at is, you know, can we do something where we would do it like one every six months, so kind of a, put them through training, or potentially do a mid-year, which ends up doing the same thing, right? If you bring on three people on mid-year, you're paying a half a year's worth of salary, and then, of course, you got the full salary the next year. Uh, so, but whatever we do to add three people at that firefighter EMT level, which is basically our entry level, it's about a $250,000 discussion item. Right? If you want to put that in mill levies, that's a, you know, that seems like everybody always wants to put things on mill levies. That's a five mil, you know, four to five mil change, which I, I, I understand the philosophy around not doing that. So, but it just, that that's the way it put it. Now, not everything's paid for by property tax. Right? You got sales tax, you got fees, you got other things, but. That, that often is where everybody goes is, you know, what's this going to cost me in a bill? And, and 
take that number and divide it by 60, because a mill is about $60,000. Gives you down and dirty. So, so that's what it is on the fire side. Again, part of the, the goal here is to help staff that second ambulance on, on more current time. Because today we run five people per shift, plus the chief and the, and the deputy chief EMS director, but they're not on a 24-hour shift. They come back. But So five people puts three on the engine and two in the ambulance. So if you go to a call and you have to transport somebody, that ambulance is out. And we know most of our calls, that ambulance can turn around in about an hour, hour and ten minutes. Uh, and back during the time that worked. But then you got that eight to ten percent of the time when you get that second call comes out in that, that hour window, kind of what we talked about the hour window, and three to five percent happens in that ten minute window. And that, that's what really starts stressing, you know, what you have to do. And so most of the time we have a paramedic on an engine, we have a paramedic on the ambulance. So even if the ambulance is out, we can still provide paramedic care, but we may have to call for a second ambulance for transport, depending on what the situation is. Or there's times when the chief and the deputy chief, it's during the day, they may, you know, they may respond to the ambulance because our deputy chief's also a paramedic. So it gives us some flexibility. But as call volume goes up, like anything else, this is an area where it's going to, it's just going to impact services as long as you have police and fire services. You know, this is the way it works. And pretty much on the same thing on the on the patrol side, uh, you know, you've heard it more times than not. I mean, the volumes are increasing, the types of crimes are changing. Uh, you know, they're getting to, you know, you get the DUI, you get the, you know, person with the gun, you get the drug cases. I mean, you're taking two people off the street. If you only have two on the street, that really makes it a challenge. Uh, Right now, I think the minimum is three on the street at all times. That's, that's our staffing. And right now, we have to use overtime to address that. I mean, just, there are certain times of the day or week that happens where people are in court, people are on, you know, off for vacations. It's, it's the same staffing model. And so over time, we're going to have to build that up. And so one idea, and again, take these for what they are. We know we can't do all this in one year. It's just not financially feasible unless somebody has found a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow uh, and they want to share. But, uh, you know, again, it's pretty much about the same as fire. It's about $75,000, $85,000 per person each time you add a person. The good thing in the police department is you can add one a year and build your staff up, right, or every six months. You have a little more flexibility there than fire just begin just how they're staffed, right? There's both 24 hours. PD works in eight hours, you know, three eight-hour shifts. Fire works in one 24-hour shift. And it's just how you have to staff things up. So an eight to ten mil increase. If you try to do everything? Yeah. Yeah, that's my Yeah. Eight to ten mil increase. I'm not recommending people that. People living here. I'm not people recommending that. Living here yeah. I'm not recommending it. I'm just, again, I think this is exactly right. I would like to see how we reduce our meal by 8 to 10. Yeah. I don't see that as an opportunity. Have we looked into, and this might probably get to the, I'm sorry. This probably get to the chiefs and and their input, but even in in their scheduling, like have we looked at um, four 10-hour days, would that be helpful in in their coverage so we're not pulling overtime, or would that make it harder for you? You'd actually add overtime. Ten, 10 hours doesn't go into 24 even at all. 12 hours doesn't work. It's just a matter of how many bodies you have assigned. And so we we run the eight hour shifts. And that works best because we have them here more times in a week. And it's what we do instead of trying to pull their days off, we extend the shift that are already on, either earlier or later, typically later. It's like a four hour overtime. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's just to have three guys out. There's only there's only six people assigned the entire day on Wednesday, just because at, it doesn't matter how, how the scheme goes. At some point, there's one day because you have to give, say for example, a Tuesday Wednesday off and a Wednesday Thursday. So in three different schedules, three different time frames, so it only leaves six people to work. 
So what we do is we drop one to 6 a.m. and move one up to 6 p.m. and they run a 12 hour day. So there's three for the 24 hour coverage. So there's a number of scheduling schemes that we do. Uh, but we've, the, the, the overtime will rate every, mainly at the end of March through the 1st of October. This is fairly common for us just because of the mere volume. But now it's we're not running two people ever. We run three people all the time. And on the fire side, we have automatic built-in overtime just because, again, we do a 200, so they work on a 212-hour, 28-day schedule. So at the 7K exemption. But base schedule is 216 hours every 28 days. And so that happens 13 times a year. So it's actually twice a year where one crew will end up with 40 hours of overtime in their schedule. It's, it's, again, it's kind of the map of it. Uh, and quite honestly, adding people won't change that. And, and oftentimes, adding people doesn't reduce your overtime, right? You may reduce the amount of overtime a person gets, but you don't eliminate, I mean, at least in my history, just adding a person on doesn't take you from overtime, you know, if you pay $85,000 for a new police officer and you're paying $85,000 in overtime, you're not going to offset. No, you're probably going to, it's probably going to stay the same. Oh, I will say both departments, they've held their overtime for the last four or five years pretty constant. We, we more, it's busted more in the fire side than on the police side. Again, we probably were under budgeting overtime. But both departments, I can say, work very diligently to try to control and figure that out and not, you know, I can say in the days we used to have, you know, captains would come in and work work on the firefighter and, you know, the firefighter moved to driver and the driver moved to captain and so you'd end up with two captains or, you know, I think we maybe even had time, might have had three captains working on a shift and so you're paying the highest dollar people work overtime, you definitely don't want to do that. And that's the same police department. You don't want to you don't want to fill all your overtime with your highest paid people uh, in the realm. So go ahead, Chief. Mr. Will also alluded to the part time. We use part time right. We cannot staff a part time position we looked at the numbers still come out to two hundred and fifty thousand plus yes. for the year. And then you're also incorporating you cannot do it with six or seven part timers. We would have to have between twenty to thirty part time personnel because we cap them at nine hundred hours a year. Because at nine hundred ninety nine hours they exceed the thousand, we are now into a P and F retirement. Right. And part of the issue gets into where do you draw that fine line at the sand of trying to offset the expenses compared to the services provided. And it's what it gets gets down to is Unfortunately, in 2014, the city moved forward with the U.S. service, and in that one year time, we had almost a 38% increase in call volume. And it is not backing down any at all, and it's not projecting to back down any at all. And that is the problem we're running into. It is it's occurring on weekends and at nights. That myself, I'm getting phone calls because we're down to one person on the phone because we're sending out both the ambulances. Um, I'm calling Tony back in, you know, I've just sent out the emails over last weekend. So we have looked at every possible model and we cannot break down and go to an eight hour shift without increasing the number of firefighters by ten positions to even go to eight hours to get away from that. So that's where we're at now. I'm looking on the fire side and we have to stay to where we're at. We're, we're about landlocked with all of our options that we have. I think this is this is not the but this is related to the compensation discussion in that we have be competitive in recruiting for these positions so people want to come and work here. Could uh, you get us the staffing levels for Bonner Springs on their PD and fire department? But they don't have a fire department. They have an ambulance. They have seven or eight, but they're converting their department. They're what? Converting? They're converting to, a, from what I understand, to a full-time fire EMS department because they're running so much overtime, basically. Is that a, is that a uh, fire department that's in a... Uh, Included with the unified government? Yeah. From my knowledge. And they have uh, eight more people than we do in the police. Yeah, they've got basically a volunteer part of that. They have, they've had seven. I don't know if they're still there, but they've had 
that seven full time on the EMS side. But because they're not a fire based EMS, they, everything over 40 hours is overtime. We do a lot with those departments. Obviously, both departments, police and fire, have a lot of crossover things that they work on and support. I mean, you know, we've had fire calls here and fire springs, it's come, or an ambulance with auto accidents, and vice versa. So we do the same thing for them. So uh, it's not like it's an overload, but I mean, that we have certain protocols where we, you know, try to share those resources. Is there, a, is there a way to, if they're starting or getting ready to start forming, or I don't know where they're at in that process, that we're, we could do something with them that would, uh, I mean, I'm just going to throw, for an example, both cities wouldn't need a ladder truck. Right. Right? Not a, not a big platform truck, you're correct. Yeah. And we don't intend to buy a platform, you know, 110 foot. We're talking about replacing the pumper with a uh, 77 foot truck, which is yeah, right. But so we're, right, yeah, and that's like when we've had fires, they brought their <coughs> their aerator truck when we needed it with their platform, and we've reached out to them. And I've talked to their city manager, and I think there's a great deal of cooperation there uh, because we both run into the the, the same things. I'm, I'm not sure there's a place around that doesn't run into it to certain levels. Uh, of how we can share resources and well, work I mean, together and things well, like that. I'm okay with sharing resources, but I'm talking about sharing financial responsibilities right. for things. I mean, right. somebody has to buy it. Right. Some city. Right. I mean, it's, it'd be, it's nice for Bonner to say, oh, they say, well, heck, Edwards has got that truck. Yeah. We're going to get a truck. Right. And there's no reason for us to buy one. Right. You know, no, no, I see. What you're so right. I mean, how how do we? I mean, it, it, is that even possible I mean, that we? I don't. I, don't yeah, know, I mean, I don't know how I, it would work. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you can always enter into interlocal agreements on on any types. Of, I mean, that's kind of what we're doing on the the air pack, right? We have, we're with the UG, right? For example, right? On, on on theirs, right? I mean, they have one at Ninety Fourth and State Avenue, right? And if we call, they come. I mean, Johnny comes. I mean, it. it it's what level of resources do we need? I mean, we don't need we don't need to run a, a platform aerial truck on every call. We don't necessarily run a pumper on every call. Not under our protocols. Right. I mean, KTK has protocols, Monitor Springs has their protocols, and, and not that they're all different, but we don't. You know, there's certain ambulance calls we send the ambulance to. We don't send the ambulance. That's changed recently, then. Yeah, I think it's uh, been the last two years. Two years that pushed back a, a whole lot. Yes. We've cut that pumper refining almost 80% of the cost. And we've caught pushback on it because we've not gone with the model that is popular in the UG. Um, but back to your original question, can we share equipment? It depends upon how much of the liability the cities want to share and how much you are wanting to, to convey to some developers that you want to stay within just one truck or you want to rely upon a neighbor who's six or seven miles away to potentially bring a piece of apparatus or not. Um, developers look at that when they come into a facility of what you're able to bring. And I know we have it presented later on that we're trying to look at replacing a piece of apparatus. There are a lot of mutual aid agreements that are in place right now between us and Bonner Springs and us and Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department. They're both just practiced here a week and a half ago. Uh, both of them are executed fairly well. Both of them are on two different types of environments and calls. However, at the same point in time as we're sitting out here at FedEx for an hour and a half, and KCK is starting to get busy, they're starting to have to turn resources loose again to deal with issues within their own city. That is the same process that goes on any time that you have mutual aid, is you cannot dump everything for one other city being involved. At the same point in time, if you start sitting there running your resources low, You've got to call them back in to take care of your own assets. We have a 105 foot platform that sets at 94th in state, mm -hmm. the 98th in state. Mm -hmm. We have a 120 foot uh, basket that sets over at Bonner. We have three more to set over here in Shawnee and Johnson County within six miles of here. That's why we have not proposed buying a 105 foot platform in, in our replacement at all um, because those resources are 
close by. That's why we've sat there and tried to shave off three hundred thousand dollars in savings by, by behind what we can utilize on the first due with that aspect. But to truly look at trying to go into any type of merger is above the pay grades that you have here. I mean, that's the conversations that have to take place city to city in the both city manager and the both city manager. And most municipalities are, are not going to look at forming districts. And I can't speak for you guys, and I can't speak for Connor Springs, because that's a conversation that's got to be had with those. Um, but I do realize and understand, you know, when we go to Bonner Springs, we provide mutual aid to Bonner Springs, um, they are 100% volunteer fire department, and we are arriving right behind their bumper. And that's us leaving out the door within a minute of turnout time of getting a call and traveling the four miles over there. So, you know, when we're sitting there calling for them, we have about a five or six minute lag time for them to get in the city here on top of their dispatch time and their time of transport to the fire station. So it can be 10 minutes from the time we call. But that's getting ready to change because they're getting the fire department. Well, I, mean, I don't know what their staffing model is, but that, that's, what we, that's what we understand in their, their budget presentation is that. And I heard that Bonner Springs, or I mean Bonner Springs, uh, Walmart was a big pusher for that because of their insurance. And it could be. Uh, I don't know if it was overlooked that uh, Bonner, uh, that, uh, uh, Bonner Springs had a volunteer fire department is why their insurance rates were sky high. Um, but it was determined, you know, found out is what I heard. And, uh, I know they have different to pull out. And they have ISO their rates, and if they have some part of their cities at one rate than the other. I think our entire city is a full which is, I mean, can you get, you know, better? But some of those, some parts of our four, we don't control, right? Hydrants, water flows. I mean, well, obviously, I mean, the reason that I'm asking is just because I'm trying to make sure that, you know, I, I don't know, I don't want, well, I don't want my parents who are on a fixed income now or that are retired, I don't want to see the bill levy increase in every, right. you know, um, taxes. Everyone talks about, you've seen rural right. land come in there and hold the mill levy, hold the mill levy, right. and, and, you know, um, taxes in Wyandotte County are just unbelievably high. And we just keep adding and adding and adding and adding, and uh, and I just want to explore all possibilities that we can be fiscally responsible to our sure. constituents. And again, the reason I'm bringing these up, again, I'm not here saying I'm bringing you a budget with eight new people in it. Because I'm not. I just want you to again. I want us to start thinking beyond. So. We know we're going to have a new development come in, right? and and that's going to help us, right? But if it's not going to generate any property tax for us for 20 years, it's going to generate more sales tax on both the special sales tax side and the regular sales tax side. Uh, I mean, you, so you you can make the argument on the special sales tax side what they're putting, what that development, that one phase, area two is going to compensate the cost to buy a replacement fire truck. Right, and, and, and that's great, but I'd like for that to not replace a fire truck and lower our mill levy. That's what I'm saying. Right. But I mean, I, we can always say, well, we're getting money in, we're getting any money in, and we can go buy more, buy more, buy more. But it won't well, I'd like to say, let's reduce our mill levy, the people that are living here and staying here, and I, so, I, I, so I, I, you can keep talking about I cannot see how you can possibly be responsible to your citizens by artificially lowering the mill levy just because you think you want to. Artificially? I, that's what, what I'm that saying. Mean? I don't know if that, well, means. you you insist on lowering the mill levy. Well, Do you want to you've got, you've got everything. No, I don't think we need to raise it. But okay. You've got certain. You've got certain. Well, here's a proposal that's going to raise it 10 percent. You've got certain no, responsibilities no, you have to maintain if you're going to lower the mill levy. Then what are you going to do? Yeah, the, and you know, you're going to make any changes to the mill levy. Yeah, none of the revenue models show any change. Any change. The no, that's what I'm saying. They're not gonna, they're, they're we're not going to say revenue. increase the mill levy, but I don't know how to you think five mills. If I put all this in place, I might have to. I'm not putting all this in place. That's what I've been saying. I'm well, then why are we getting it? Why are we getting it? If it's not something that we're going to... Well, because I'm trying to get us to move past just thinking tomorrow, 
that understand as development's coming and things that we're doing, these are decisions we're going to have to make. I mean, these don't go... You can't continue to provide the same level of service if, if, unless we want to cut services. And I've never had the feeling that we that we want to reduce our service. I don't know. I don't know. That's we never had that discussion. Okay. I, I'm just saying, I've never taken that position. That's never been a position that's been presented to me that somebody wanted to cut the services here. Okay. One thing that I like in this, I know we're kind of rabbit trailing right. here, and so right. I'll keep it brief. And I've talked to you a little bit about this. Is um, is there a way to use our money um, to where we can still do the great things for the, the employees here and, and our fire and our police and admin? Um, but it's got to come from somewhere. So is there a way to do that that isn't going to raise our mill levy um, substantially? But can we take it from somewhere else, or can we? Um, you know, I talked to you about how much of our tax dollars go to the community college. I mean, right. it's a, a huge amount of money um, that we, it's nice to have a community college nearby, but we don't have hardly any say in it, and they're building brand new ball fields. And so maybe even our representation in within the UG could say, okay, maybe Edwardsville needs more of their money to be in our pockets to decide well, they, where it helps. I mean, not, not to totally pick on the UG, but several of y'all know this one. Right? They took away the sci-fi money for building roads. They took $125,000 out of this community from the county taxes. And so you either keep building roads or you stop building roads. Now, again, I, I, to your point, so the new development's good. I think we've negotiated a good development agreement. And we that pumper that we're replacing has to get replaced. There, there's, I mean... It, they they grow old and you know we're spending I mean we've we've spent I know well in excess of seventy or eighty thousand dollars on that piece of equipment far more than it should have cost for its life cycle so but that development that special tax money there that's growing covers the cost to replace the fire truck I, I mean I think that is the kind of thing she wanted right there unfortunately we don't necessarily have the ability to, you know, control the, 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 the taxing of the other entities. But, you know, again, that's, again, that's special sales tax, that, right? That's not taxes we can use for general operation. I can't pay for people with it. I can't build buildings with it. I, you know, there's a lot of things I can't do with it because of how it was passed. And we can always go back and say, well, we want to do this differently through the process, and at some point we'll have to redo it. Well, I, I, I mean, I just want you to know, I'm not coming in here saying we're going to do all this tomorrow. I'm saying I'm really trying to get us looking beyond tomorrow as we are making decisions, and I think we've made good decisions, but, but, we're, but we, you know, when another warehouse gets built and it's another 500,000 square feet or things like that, it's good. It's coming on. It's coming on, we're getting some pilot's revenue, and ultimately we'll get property tax revenue. But the day it opens, I gotta provide services. Right? I don't I don't get the ten years. I, I have to provide service day one when the door opens. I gotta provide the police, and I gotta make sure the roads are plowed, and I, I gotta provide the fire or the EMS, and we gotta pay these people, we gotta do all the things to run a building and run an operation. And that's really what I'm trying to say, it's just I want us to understand that there's the long-term piece here. And, you know, 10 years ago, we were in survival mode, right? We were pre-borrowing money on our taxes. We were borrowing against future tax revenues. That is definitely not what we want to be. But we've, I mean, I, I don't have it because it's from a previous thing, but I mean, we haven't been raising the mill levy. It has been, I mean, it got reduced. Unfortunately, last year it got reduced without input. That's the challenge I have. I think we would have still reduced it but would we have reduced it by 1.3 mils? I don't know because that, you I, never got is that. Is that an artificial reduction? I don't even know what that means. Well, I don't even know what an artificial reduction because is. Because well, an artificial know. reduction is just to lower the property taxes just for the general purpose of lowering property taxes. Well, no, I, I, what I'm saying is now you've got a certain amount of services you have to provide. Why are you going to cut revenue? What other reason is there? 
to drop a mill levy, is what I'm saying. I don't, I, I don't, see, any, I don't see any reason to drop a mill levy, but I haven't seen any reason to raise it either. So, and, uh, you know, it's not just Chuck Stein saying this. Go ask every single citizen in Wyandotte County and in Evansville what the number one thing, you can see people in the audience shaking their head yes, that our taxes are through the roof. And they want to see it, I don't care how it happens, artificially, uh, um, stem cell, however you want to do it. They want their taxes reduced. To so set up here and say, um, to not even explore options, I think is asinine to even suggest that we don't um, look at other methods or possible I, I methods. I wish you wouldn't have used that word asinine. That's, 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 that was unnecessary. Well, that's the one I used. Well, you're so, asinine. I'm right not, and again, I'm so not. I know you used it. I'm not that's here. Right. And again, right. make sure I understand. So I'm, I'm not I'm here saying we should raise it or lower. I'm just trying to provide. You've got to remember, that. the city only gets 25% of the property tax. 25%, and you want the city to be responsible for lowering everybody's mill levy when you have all these other entities, the county, the, as, as uh, Caroline said, the community college. My God, that's ridiculous. But it's, we only have 25% of the property tax. But, I, but again, my, my point for last year that we didn't get to have a discussion you politically is we were given numbers of what our values were that were inaccurate. I'm sure the voters and, will decide soon. Well, I'm just saying it was inaccurate, so if we would have had accurate information, you could have made, I think if you had accurate information, you could make a lot better decisions. I the know. UG just, in their budget, reduced by 2% their mill, or 2 mills. The city. The city. The city. Uh, I can't. The city, not on the count. I'll say it, or he can continue to talk over me. I don't right. want to do this. I mean, if this... I want to, I want to explore options yeah. that will help our taxpayers save money, retain residents, and build in, in Edwardsville. That's all I'm saying. And I, and I think we've been doing that year over year. We've been doing that. And, and I think our development is proof of some of that. That's why they're here and continuing to come. I mean, okay, so again, I'm not going to go on the seasonals. Uh, but just to talk about capital investments, because some of these things, quite honestly, once again, we may not have decisions in these. So we talked about the fire apparatus being an aerial truck. It's replacing the pumper. It then becomes a vehicle that can do more than one purpose, right? So you have large buildings throughout the city or a residential house that part of what you want to try to do is get above it, right? And, and that's where an aerial truck. Again, we're not talking about the large 110-foot platform type of truck. These are often the purpose of quints or multi-purpose vehicles. 620 has reached the end of its life. It's, it, you know, it's going to be replaced at some point. Uh, so we have been looking at this. Uh, unfortunately, with some of the recent economics and the, especially the tariffs on, on metals, is having a big impact on a lot of things. And as you know, fire trucks have a lot of metal on them. So uh, there's there's some opportunity if you want to look at it. it. Doesn't impact the budget, but look at it as a possibility this year because there are long lead times, six to nine months to get a vehicle like that. So what we're showing you is there's options there. We can wait and waiting will cost money we can potentially purchase this year, it arrives next year, and that's, it impacts the pricing. We've looked at payments, so assuming you bought it in the current year, and again, these are numbers, they're, they're solid numbers, but you know, you get down to the bottom line, all of these would come back. You're looking at about $75,000 a year payments um, to start in late 2019, uh, paid for out of special sales tax fund, so it's not going to impact the general fund budget or those types of things. I think one of the things we do have to keep in mind is our special sales tax fund. I know it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but we adopted it in 2014. And right now, everything we have funded in it will be paid off before the expiration of that. At some point, we have to look at renewing that or not renewing that. And of course, that decision would impact if you, I mean, you're going to buy a fire 
contract that I get at some point. And if you buy them, you're generally not going to pay cash for them. You're going to pay them off over a fairly useful life. We've used 12 years for this purpose because that truck probably has a 15-year front line and another you know, three to five, so you're really it's a twenty year purchase. And you can take payments out farther, but it's probably not a fiscally you know, it'd be like financing your house for forty years and you know it's a thirty year deal. So um, the other thing that we we're looking at from and again this is really a bond issuance potential is do we implement our facility plan? All right, that's a big big capital item. Again we're not saying we'll do this in the budget, but all of these things have some mix as we look long term. Again, phase one of that plan was to add the wing to the fire station so you have places for people to be. Uh, remodel the apparatus bay, which is just because you're moving things. And then turning the admin crew quarters into the administration area, and you eliminate the temporary buildings that we're paying for over there. Obviously, that doesn't, removing the temporary buildings doesn't pay for it all, but this is in keeping with what we've done with the facility. So it's out there uh, you know, as we move forward. Uh, again, we put together a very broad budget. It's about $2.6 million. It's a very at the, you know, preliminary, preliminary stage the architect put some money together. I think, you know, I don't know where you'd spend $250,000 on site work if you already own the site. Uh, but again, Money's put in there, contingencies of you know three hundred forty-five thousand. Those dollars come down as you move forward on projects. Uh, debt service, where you know, if you funded it from a debt service standpoint, we have the financial advisors run the numbers. The way it falls out, your first debt service payment really starts in twenty twenty-two, uh, and that annual payment would be about two hundred ninety-five thousand a year to fund the two point six million. So, you know, you, you look at that, as you all remember, our debt service mill, what we owe, we're in that time when that rate, if you don't have, you know, your debt's going off the books, and so you can hold your debt levels fairly level by being, uh, you know, paying your debt purchases in a timely manner. This is one, <clears throat> well, we're not going to have much say-so over, and this is, implementing the MS4 NVP gas permits. We are covered under this permitting system by law, by federal law. And we have to inventory our stormwater and our sewer facilities. So every manhole, every lift station, every drainage culvert, every inlet box, we have to prepare first and foremost an inventory. And then we have to put together a plan showing how we're going to maintain and replace those over a period of time, not to mention any number of other things, sampling of water or things that you know, That's probably, the inventory alone is somewhere it, well in excess of fifty up to $100,000. We got one bid that was $200,000 when we got it. This is not something we can say no to. This is a federally required deal because we're in, in the urbanized area have to do these things. So again, most of this is going to, you know, we'll pay the sewer system, we'll pay for the sewer portion of it. The other one will probably have to come out of general fund because we don't have a stormwater utility. That may be something we want to look at. Most cities around here do have those, which is basically you, you calculate a fee of each property owner based upon impervious surfaces or some mechanism, pays a small fee. And that's what you use to inventory and maintain the stormwater system. Much like water systems, sewer systems, and it's just a utility type of fee that pays for these federally required mandates. So they don't send us any money, but we just get the mandates. And I know we're aware of that. So. Um, and then street improvements, you know, the question is what are we, you know, we, we've more or less done our neighborhood streets. We, we, We'll update our plan as far as where we're at. Uh, but you know, what do we want to do next? What what are the roads that we want to prioritize? You know, we did issue some bond money to look at buying rights of way that we you know decided we didn't want to proceed on some of that. Uh, there's a little bit of that money left, not much. 
Uh, we will have, you know, uh, the Riverview Crossroads project, as we call it. Uh, we have a three million dollar federal grant. Obviously, we'll have to match those monies. Um, we, as we know, there's some movement on development uh, up on the north side there, on the Bonner Springs piece of that. And, and how do we tie the developer into being part of this? And I think there's been positive responses to that, so that they would not necessarily cover all the costs, but they would be part, you know, partner with us in that. So the amount of money we have to spend out of our local tax dollars would not be as much uh, if we can get the development to help pay for the cost, which I think is always a goal that we look at. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I put other discussions, but I, I think we probably covered most of them. But I just, if there are any questions or comments, and, uh, again, we'll be here at the next meeting uh, talking about more of the details. Uh, we'll get you a copy of the current pay plan. Uh, that's out there by position. No problem. I'm not sure if there was other specific items, but I certainly will get that to everybody. We'll get that out tomorrow. Would you attach, and I know we, we've gone over it before, but the um, competitive pay scale sure. that, that we've done a couple of months ago? Just so yeah, we can do that as well. well. Again, what we did was we took, and I, I just did a spreadsheet, we took every position we have and we plugged it into this uh, uh, survey that was done through the Mid-America Regional Council. We covered. Now, we didn't take in every, some of their data is from different places we focused and we listed out all those cities so we'll give you that list and uh, again it's throughout the, the area uh, I will say that generally speaking in that survey cities under 25,000 in many cases pay better than over 25,000 which I thought was interesting and certainly Kansas pays better than Missouri I mean just if you go down the line generally speaking you're not finding every job but Missouri tends to pay less than Kansas. Can't tell you why, but that's just, you know, that's the data. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We still have other things, I'm sorry. Yeah. We do. You're next. Ah, well, I just got done. <laughs> uh, the only thing I really have is I will be out of the office uh, next week uh, on my annual vacation with my friend from Northern Ireland, but as always, I will certainly have access to phones and computers and all those kind of things, and share my absence that uh, Zach will be ready to take care of any anything, as well as our trusty department that will be doing a job. I don't know if you have any updates on the festival you want to give us. Um, we just announced so our concert Headliner is set. His name is Kane Cox. He's um, uh, one of the, he's an upcoming guy in out of the Nashville scene. He's actually friends with Cassie Joy, who was with us a few years back. And then our two openers are the Dirty Bur Dirty Bourbon Band, which is kind of their their regular on the KC bar scene. And then uh, another group out of Nashville called Matville Green that has got some local ties as well. So. The concert for Every Little Days is set. We're getting in some, some sponsorships, so I, I mean, Atmos Energy has agreed to sponsor the disc golf event happening on Friday night. Uh, Bank Midwest has the, will be sponsoring the Community Craft Fair. I mean, the Bank and Trust and BBC Rose has announced some sponsorship for different areas, so that's, that's the, the primary thrust of the planning committee right now is to get into our local stakeholder community. And it really is not possible without some of their participation. We've also had some, some discussions with Fastenal and FedEx as far as their participation. So that's been a goal as to how do we get some of our, you know, it's hard sometimes in the industrial corporate part because the, those decision makers are in Minnesota or out of the country or, or whatever. So, uh, you know, of course they're in multiple cities and, and it's hard for them to say we're going to sponsor every town that has a festival when we're in 500 different places. But, uh, we have had some good feedback. I think we'll see some some out of that. Okay, thank you. Chief of uh, Somewhat of a broken record. Again, we stayed pretty busy uh, for almost every bit of 90 days I had.
that in our case draws a number of drug cases. Uh, for example, we had methamphetamine again, but it's, it's never really gone away, but it was in a lull. We had a lot of marijuana cases in the past, but methamphetamine has really uh, taken off again. Uh, and not only that, we're gun cases mixed in with those, uh, uh, we have a, lot, a number of stolen cars, that sort of thing. So we've been, again, uh, just that, we're staffing three people. Uh, what what really comes down to is we, we try to avoid taking their days away from them, their days off away from them. Because what's going to happen, we only run so long that you get the vigilance fatigue. And we've said that a thousand times in the last 11 years uh, of trying to kind of plug all of the holes in what we need to do is we're always down. We've never come a year prior to my time and since my time that there hasn't been a vacancy somewhere in the system. It's just the way it is. Uh, through you know, one year we had three retirements. I mean, you would expect that. So, uh, but then again, it's the hiring process. So we're never, there's no such thing in this business anymore as full staff. You're just never there. So again, I, I think my only worry, and it's my worry every year, is that. Uh, uh, we have that vigilance fatigue, and, and guys are they're, they're just calling them sick just to, just to rest, and that sort of thing. And we've had maybe a case of that here and there, but uh, overall, they've embraced it. Somewhat usual in the, in the summertime that we do this anyway, but it's uh, been, been very busy. Uh, our citation levels are, we're tracking about 25 plus percent over what we did last year, and that's not even associated with the case files that we're dealing with. So our detectives, we're, we're so short-handed on patrol, one of our detectives has moved out, so there's only two of them, and they're working 44 cases, and they only work the serious cases, uh, felonies, that sort of thing, uh, child care, those kind of cases. So there's one guy trying to do the drug cases and 44 other cases. It was a lot of work. And of course, we have to have training and all the other things. And one of the things we're doing right now is we waited some time to have our uh, Milo simulator from uh, Midwest Public Risk. They bought a use of force simulator to put out to all of the uh, uh, police departments in the area that are part of the NPR, uh, our, our risk uh, and insurance company, that's NPR, if you don't know who that is. Uh, but we have it set up in the training room and uh, training all of our guys in use, use of force simulations. So it includes firearms as well as the taser and the OC spray. So we get all three of them and it's a video interaction. So it's, it's actually uh, getting a lot of raves, but we were on the list for quite a while. We have it for seven days. We've invited Bonner, a few, few other agencies around who might have some people who might just want to come. And we're doing it whenever the shifts are on and they haven't had the training, we're spending a couple of hours in the room and doing some of that. So it's been real positive. So that's what we're up to. Thank you. Chief Whittle. Uh, two guys who have transported have had no ill effects since they were evaluated on KU. We do have the chemical proposal of what was uh, manufactured in that back after the polymerization aspect of it. Um, we have gone back through the rewashed and deconned all the equipment and gear on that site again uh, that morning uh, in accordance with the MSD or the safety data sheets on that uh, benzene chemical that was created. Those were two, uh, I wouldn't say significant or major, but those were just two issues that were dealt with within a 48 hour time frame. Those are hazards that we have in industrial complexes here in little old Edwardville population. 800 people. Um, you know, like I said, we have to rely upon mutual aid agencies to help us out with that. Uh, we have worked diligently with our crews in three years to get there. The, don't lose the aspect of the big side that 900 of our calls last year were emergency medical major calls. In the two years uh, since we first got here myself and Mr. Purr, we have reduced the pump off of about 80% of those calls. That pumper will only respond with that ambulance when it's a cardiac event, such as cardiac arrest or chest pain, a stroke or a change in a neurological condition, a difficulty breathing or a choking situation, any major type of trauma or blood loss or automobile accidents, or an unresponsive and unknown patient. So we've taken those top six priority medical calls and have gone against the grain of most of what the Metro does to try to facilitate a more wiser and economically responsible approach to reduce our costs. We have worked diligently with our billing company to try to increase our revenue stream from that to ensure that we are trying to capture every bit of 
feasible doing it that we can to help out and offset the costs that we have within the budget. Now, that being aside, we're still CAC 5s, Medicaid, Medicare, and some of those items. We are looking at this year, we have had a little bit of a lull coming into the summer, although it has started to pick up the number of medical calls that we've had here in the last two weeks. That has also increased our number of times that our second <coughs> ambulance is out. As Mr. Webb alluded to before, myself and Mr. Burr will grab that second ambulance during the duty day. If it occurs after normal duty hours, you will see our bumper crew, the driver and the paramedic in the back, get out and snap that second ambulance. And that captain calls me and then Mr. Burr, and you'll see me start coming back here. The station start back on that bumper because we run a smaller amount of fire ready calls. Um, going into that, we're now starting to look at uh, the hot point. We are 30 days away from Grand Cruise Grand Fire Truck Ride. Yep. We know that this is starting to be the high point of the holiday season and we will start getting the requests for help um, from the exposures that our guys, police officers have with the community. We start identifying the families, those that are going to need help at Christmas time, we start interviewing them, start to put all that together. So you will start seeing our guys ramping up uh, getting ready for that motorcycle run here at the end of August and then a golf scramble that is typically scheduled from the middle of October. So hopefully this year we have some better weather with it. Other than that, that's all I have. Thank you. Totally for it. Yeah. Um, briefly, um, I'm certain you're all aware that the trail project has been paid a few weeks ago. Um, all we have to do is get that contractor to come back and send a little bit of billing and see. So hopefully within the next two or three weeks that project will be complete. That'll be a nice little addition, you know, to, to our trails here in Brazil. Um, also, the flow mirror project down on Wood End is going to start again in the middle of August, so hopefully that will be wrapped up at the end of August. And on a good note, um, July 30th, we expect our new wastewater foreman um, to start working on our public work side. So um, we're looking forward to a new body in our field operations to um, take care of our sanitary sewers and and, and, and work with the two men that we have. Uh, so kind of really ask for this. So thank you. Thank you. I don't have anything at the moment. Um, I was wondering which spots are still open that you're still hiring for within the city. Well, the mouse race is always a popular. We, we really try to use the mouse race for. No, no, no. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I understand you're hiring the mice, but just for like the admin positions, and I know we're usually hiring police and fire. I was just wondering what we still have. So we actually just today um, was the first day. I actually said this earlier, but it was the first day for our new customer service clerk, Heather Jones. So today was her first day on the job. So we are still recruiting on the admin side for the permits, billing, and collection thing in position. And we have uh, a couple of candidates that we're looking at. Police, fire. I think right now, as far as open spots, we have all of those filled out. We have a guy that's going to be added in. And, and the fire, again, we use part-time. We don't necessarily have a, you know, per se a number, because you have to have enough people to fill at the time. So. Generally, recruiting people if, if, you know, to qualify people. We look at them. So we, we kind of look at the dollars and not necessarily, you know, we have to fill positions like we would with, with full time. Uh, and then that is one of the challenges with part time because we, we do have limitations because of, of the retirements and even the medical, um, how, much, how many hours a person can work before you're legally obligated to do that is, for example, her KPF papers. If they go over the hours, you go back to hour one, and the entity picks up that tab. Right. So we, we, we watch that very closely. And, and, and really, they use part-time, or well, most of our seasonal people, you know, they're three or four hundred hours in a season type of, of, of college to, to three or sometimes in schools ending and you know, they're all going you know, back to school on the 10th, 12th, whatever, so most of them are heading back in the next few weeks. I wanted to uh, just comment on this, the budget situation a little bit. I 
you know, I can agree and I can disagree with a lot of things, but what I am seeing out of the staff is the proactive foresight that you're using, you know, looking into the next two or three years and kind of planning for the future. And I think maybe we're getting a little bit confused on, you know, the order that this is going to happen and the expenses it's going to cost. I think the mill levy needs to stay at least where it is and try not to increase it whatsoever. Uh, lowering it would be great, but I don't there's no way you can do that and provide the services that we're having to provide anymore. And I don't see that we really need to have any really arguments or anything about that because it's I think the way you're presenting it is looking pretty good and it's making it's kind of preparing us and the council will be coming in getting them ready for that and making it so it's a little bit easier transition for that. So I just that's my opinion on that. I know that I've always been very pleased with the way you and your staff have handled this situation. And uh, it is a great town to live in. And you know, I've been here my entire life. And I've seen it go from a, a, a hearse for an ambulance in the back of a funeral home. They, you know, they pick you up and take you to the hospital or take you back to where the hearse came from. And it's a lot better now than it used to be. But that's just my feeling on that. And I don't know that there needs to be, you know, words or anything according to this. But, that's just where I stand, and that's my opinion. I was going to ask about the employee situation, you know, in front of kind of trying to ease the load up on you guys, because I know that you're busier than, than heck in there, and uh, I realize that, and I sympathize with that. I asked Zach the other day, but I forgot, why is there no barbecue contest? At the part of our festival? Yes. Yeah. That's because... Essentially, it doesn't really add anything to the festival. It's, it's almost a net negative because it takes up a lot of space in terms of could be used for parking. And there's just not a lot of, that we have seen in the last couple of years, of crossovers where people are coming for the barbecue fest and then going to the festival. Okay. Or, and, and vice versa because the barbecue, fest, the barbecue contest is really kind of an insular activity. It's really just for the people who have signed up for it. It's not like there's public tastings or anything like that. So people can smell the barbecue and it smells yeah. great, but they can't really play with everybody else. And it, it just, it's a, it's a logistical complication that is not having it makes it much well, easier. Well, thanks for explaining that to me. Yeah, well, and, 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 and it wasn't cha that the chamber right. managed both barbecue yeah. contests mm -hmm. and they're, they're not doing the barbecue. For they're they're, they're, they're they're not doing it because they, they, the yeah. amount of effort and stuff, and at the end of the day, um, it's essentially a money loser. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's for, for both the chamber. And I have had people asking about that. Yeah. But the chamber ran the barbecue. That was okay. always a chamber piece of the function. And then the last thing that I had is uh, anybody can do anything about the hole down at the post office? Um, is that a, ours? Or that is a private property? driveway, and that's owned by the property owner. And we got any recourse on that because there's going to be something happened down there. I have sent in a code violation notice. Um, I've spoke with him numerous times, uh, but it is private property. Yeah. Well, something's going to happen because now there's cement blocks. I saw that. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and he was he was sent a letter today and he was physically served the letter today from code enforcement about that being dangerous. Thank you. Okay. Couple of things. Um, Michelle, excited if you get to stay part time with us. I know you wanted to, or was, we're going to retire a year or so ago, but we're glad you stayed now. Even more glad if you're able to stay. Thank you. And she might change her that, mind. Too, well, so. she might, but I hope that works out. Yeah, tremendous. I know every, everybody does such tremendous work, but Michelle, that the numbers are, nobody wants to touch those numbers. That's no, I think doing stuff. a great job. We're in good hands. Absolutely. And Zach, um, I thought I'd mention we had a Parks and Recs meeting last week. And I don't know if it's the first time that they're offering machine pitch and t-ball in the fall. In the fall, it's good, correct. It's kind of exciting. I think they'll get some some good feedback and some good participation. So yeah, the signs went live at the end of last week, yes. so I can be able to provide an update as far as sign up for there. Which is exciting. So those kids, you know, soccer. It's everything, but you know, the rock gets one play, other stuff too. So, anyway, and I think it's been a focus, right? Those kind of things. How can we, how can we better like, parks as an example? How do you know, utilize the facilities, and how can we provide new opportunities for our youth to participate, whether baseball or soccer? Or, 
whatever, you know. And we do try to look at those and say, you know, they should somewhat break even, right? As far as the cost to put it on, they're never going to pay for the cost of owning the fields and those kind of things. But I mean, we, we do. We saw some jobs and a few things. I think it was soccer maybe or something. Yeah, there was offers it. At our young, at the younger levels, that yeah. there, you see some competition with the area wise and, and things like that. But with ball ball and, and some of the things that we kind of have discussed, the parks board will eventually discuss, you know, around the disc golf and football course and futsal and different leagues and programs we can offer around that to kind of diversify the program we have. Ball ball is an example of that, and that we might have, we may have some kids who used to play fall soccer that now want to do fall ball, so our fall soccer might might go down a little bit, but as a whole, we think we will. more kids will sign up for a program in, in total. So I think that it, 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 it the first year we're doing it, so obviously we're going to be continuing to evaluate it, but it's, um, yeah, we're hopeful that it will be Sure. Um, I had asked about uh, trash pickup. Yes. And uh, asked for, like, what, uh, how we can look at the uh, Sheriff's Department and for uh, help getting trash picked up, or not sheriff's sure, department, I'm sorry, uh, the city uh, court. Our uh, both are, yeah, yeah. The judge and the prosecutor were out uh, this last period, and so they weren't here in the, the court. But we have talked about setting that up again as probably one or two times a month where they can assign people uh, to, to those duties and our code enforcement officer kind of names the people where we need them at and uh, that's that's the program. Code enforcement officers for people that have been assigned community service? Well, we have to have somebody oversee them so that oh, no, that's, that's my right. question. Yeah, yeah. I was asking. Yeah. Oh. They, so they can make sure they get to the right place and and, and you know be there. Somebody has to sign off on their hours that they do right. and get it back to the court, you know, process for all people. Uh, tree trimming on 98th Street, I've asked now for about two months um, for the mower that we purchased that has the arm to go down 98th Street. Do we know where that's at? Um, yes, we, as of tomorrow, we'll actually be fully staffed and, and the crews will get back on using the uh, riding arm. Unfortunately, one of the issues with a two-person crew is that and unfortunately they take vacation and they're sick and one person can't go out and do a lot of the work that we do here be on the streets or, or do a right away type of thing and on that specific piece of equipment our guys had to spend time to, to learn it and learn how to operate it in, in a safe condition so um, we do know 98 streets a priority and, and um, they've operated on other um, roads and, and they feel confident that uh, hopefully within the next couple weeks we'll be on 98 street is aren't there a person that was hired specifically to run that now? The part-time person. Um, there, there. there is a part-time person who um, has yet to start in the process getting all the paperwork and things going. Um, actually, he's going to start this week as well. Um, but that's just the evening and weekend whenever he's available. Um, so it's not a, a full-time during the daytime hours. So that's going to take away from other staff doing their job during the day because they're going to have to be within on the weekend and nights as well. So. It's not an ideal situation, but yes, he's, he's going to start this week all. Okay. And I, too, agree about uh, that this conversation didn't need to be turned into an argument over, uh, but for some reason somebody wanted to argue about it. Um, the, we're responsible for 25% of the, what the property tax. I understand that, but that's 25% that we are responsible for, and we have control over. So I'm not trying to dictate or trying to figure out how the UG does theirs. I'm talking about what we and what we were elected to do. And that's and I will continue to ask that if people like it or not. Um, now, granted, I'm not saying no way at all. You are you're putting things in here that said a mill increase. I think that I absolutely have the right to think, hey, I'd like to see it go down. Sure. Um, and I too agree that I don't want to see an increase at all. Uh, that's more dollars out of every taxpayer's pocket. Nobody wants to see that. Uh, and, and maybe some do. I'm not sure. Um, but 
all I was saying, and I think that you, you guys have all done a great job in getting us to where we're at now. What I'm trying to say is if we can look at ways, I don't know what they are. Never, I didn't say I had the answers. I said let's look at ways that maybe we can, when development gets to the, uh, uh, once that finally gets there and we start generating some dollars, I mean, that then, you know, it's nice to have dollars to start to play with it. Right now it's not happening. We've got a dirt field still. Grass. But so <laughs> <I> need <blowing. laughs> uh, So I'm just saying, you know, I um, where does it end? Right. You know, I mean, I understand new toys and everything. So I, I I get it. I mean, I want new stuff. I, everybody wants new stuff and more people. And all, I get it. I'm not against that. But maybe we can give the fewer people more money. You know, if there's a way to restructure things or do something different. I don't know what that looks like. And maybe we utilize what the UG has to help us do that. I don't, I'm just putting things out there of ways for people to maybe think about it. You know, the um, you mentioned the fire department in Bonner, so that got me to thinking, man, is there a way that we could utilize them maybe? The sheriff's department has a patrol. And maybe at night time that we can... Uh, dictate, or dictate. Uh, we could ask the uh, sheriff to, to maybe do more patrol in Edwardsville that would help us reduce the three person down to two people at night time. I don't know, just ideas is all I was trying to think of. There's things that we can think of that will help us save some money and not increase our bill. And, and again, I, I agree, I, and I wasn't trying to suggest mill that increases. I just, Oftentimes, the discussion about what does something cost gets put into a mill levy discussion. So, what's one mill and how does it compare to that? And, and again, I, I want to be perfectly clear. I'm not suggesting we're going to go do all that or increase mill levies or, or, or make those. And so, I'm really just trying to make sure we have all the information so we all can continue to make good decisions. And my only other thing about last year's mill levy is simply that, it, from, a, from a standpoint of view as a body being able to make the decision, we were somewhat, I mean, the body made the decision based on the information we want to hold the mill levy steady. Had we known that we had two and a half million dollars and whatever that generated in revenues, you may have made, said, you know what, we want to reduce the mill levy. But instead of it being 1.1 or 1.3 mil, we want to reduce it by half of it. That is, that's my frustration is that, that you as this body and us as staff didn't have accurate information to make good decisions. And, and so we now have the numbers that we have, and they are with what they are. And, and so that was really the, the discussion around that. I, it, it is what it is. But, I don't think we as a whole body, as a city, uh, and it's true the other taxing entities that were dependent upon that same tax rate, didn't necessarily get to make all the decisions, but oftentimes we don't have all the information to make the best decisions possible. So. And just like the, um, was mentioned earlier about the uh, developers looking at right. fire departments, they also look at the mill levy. Certainly. Talk to them all the time, right. and, and it's a and it's a topic. And when when you can look at going to another location or another city um, that has that a lower bill levy, and and it's coming out of their pocket, I mean that, that's a decision uh, process that they have to go through. Sure. And so and so if. If we're able, and like I was saying, if we're able to get that hold tight, reduce it if we can, uh, do it, and, and still attract development, that's what we'll continue to do. It, it, it kind of, not to belabor the point, I agree with pretty much everything you're saying, but there is. You don't agree with it. So there is the, the aspect of the, uh, the tax loop, and the, it's, it's 
not specifically related to the mill levy, but there are implications of lowering the mill levy one year and then with the tax put in place and limiting the amount of money that you can spend property taxes mm -hmm. on. And anyway, it's just a, it was just one of the new things that we're, we have to take into consideration. There's already a cap on the amount of money. There's exceptions built in, but that, that uh, of property taxes that you could spend in the community, that the mill levy, you know, we, from year to year, that tax lid uh, and how you structure the mill levy is a consideration in the future. Sure. That's all. Um, to the council and to Chuck, I apologize for my interruption and in behavior. Uh, I apparently agree are both as passionate about our position as, as each other are, and, and I think that's healthy. But uh, we're going to move forward. That's all I know. We're on the way. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Jim.